Good morning, congregation and guests on this beautiful Sunday morning. It's my privilege to welcome you all here as we gather to worship our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We welcome all guests worshiping with us here at Emmanuel Canadian Reformed Church. We hope you feel welcome here today. We also welcome all guests worshiping via live stream. Council has the following announcements this morning. An attestation has been requested by Brother Matthew Gelderman for the Yarrow Canadian Reformed Church in BC. So with joy, the consistory can announce that Rihanna De Jong, Liam DeBoer, Deandra DeWitt, Sierra Duker, Lindsay Gordon, Haley Veer, Caleb Watson, Ileana Van Orizandi, Anna Van Bosselin, Tessa Van Dyke, Hannah Van Spronzen, Julie Bosch, Sam Tolsma, and Hannah Kolkman have indicated that they wish to publicly profess their faith. After examination by the consistory, we can accede to their requests. If no lawful objections are brought forward, their public profession will take place, the Lord willing, on both May 5 and on a later date in early June. It's also a reminder of the potluck supper, which is to be held after this afternoon's worship service. I may also announce that after four weeks of prayer and deliberation, our pastor, Reverend Vince Bronson, has declined the call extended to him by the Grace Canadian Reformed Church of Winnipeg. This morning's worship service will be led by our emeritus pastor, Reverend Bill Slump. Welcome, brother. And in preparation for worship, we will praise our God with the singing of Psalm 135, stanzas 1, 6, and 10. brothers and sisters, let us now rise for worship and lift up our hearts unto the Lord. Let us together confess our dependence upon the Lord. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made 
heaven and earth. Amen. Receive now God's greeting, grace and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us now sing together in response from Psalm 115, the stanzas 1, 4, and 6. It's a joy to know that we are God's covenant children and that God has established his covenant with us in spite of our sins. But we must show our thankfulness to him in the way that we keep the laws of the covenant, the ten words. So let us hear these laws and afterwards sing together from Psalm 115, from, Psalm, from hymn 65. The stanzas one and four, hymn 65, one and four, if you but let your father guide you. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, 
for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. The Lord Jesus teaches this in a summary in Matthew 22. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Let us now call upon the name of the Lord in prayer and ask his blessing over this worship service. In our prayer, we will remember our sister, Anna van Delden, who will undergo surgery, the Lord willing, because of suspected ovarian cancer. Let us pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we come before your holy throne because we know that through prayer, we can transcend the distance that exists between us. For we know that you see us and you hear us and are eager to listen to what we have to say. You want to hear from us because you love us and because we, you want us to be close to you, to your bosom. O Lord, because of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we have access to your power your greatness, your majesty, your wisdom and understanding. He is the door through whom we may enter your holy sanctuary. How wonderful that you have revealed that to us and given us faith so that we do not have to doubt even when we are in dire circumstances. For you promised never to abandon us. 
Heavenly God and Father, you are the almighty God who knows everything and therefore who knows us better than we know ourselves. You know what our needs are and how and when to fulfill them. Teach us this morning what that means. O Lord, grant that in all circumstances we may know that you are on your throne and that nothing, no matter what happens, can separate us from your love. O Lord, we think of what is happening in the world, especially right now in the Middle East. Lord, we pray for peace, that there the bloodshed and the hatred may dissipate, and Lord, that you may rule in the hearts of the people there. Lord, be with those who are suffering all over the world. Father, be merciful to them, O Lord, and teach them to call upon you, for only with you can our needs be met. O Lord, be with every member of this congregation. You know the kinds of things that we go through in our daily lives. Lord, guide us and give us wisdom and understanding and comfort us. And Lord, we ask you to be with our sister, Hannah van Delden, as she awaits news about her suspected ovarian cancer and as she faces surgery. She's a precious child of yours, Lord, and we ask you to be with her, to comfort her, and to help her not to be anxious about what the future will bring for her life, as all our lives is in your hands. And be with her husband, Brad, and their children, and her family as well, that they may be a support to her, and that they too may trust in you. Bless the medical intervention that she is receiving, and that it may have the desired result. We pray, O Lord, that no cancer be found. But we know, O Lord, that all things are in your hands, and we thank you for the peace that that gives us. Lord, we also remember in our prayer our brother, our young brother, Isaac Hogedijk, whose condition continues to be of great concern. Lord, we pray for a full recovery and that soon he will be able to communicate again with his parents and his fiance and the doctors. Be with him and he is lonely and afraid. Speak to him, O Lord, as only you can. Let him know that you love him and that no matter what, he is safely in your your arms. And be with all those who are in similar circumstances, O Lord, that those who are unable to speak, that you do speak to them. You can reach them, Heavenly Father. You know all things. And Father, we thank you for the comfort that that gives us. Be with all of us as we celebrate the gift of life. Be with those who are celebrating birthdays and other significant events. We thank you that we have so many things to be thankful for. Help us to give thanks in all things, O Lord, that we do not have a disposition of constant dissatisfaction. And Lord, we ask you to be with Reverend Vince Bronson and his family We thank you, Lord, that he can continue to minister here in this congregation. Lord, we thank you for his ministry, and we ask you to give him health and the ability to perform his task here, Lord, and be with his wife and children as well, with his whole family, Heavenly Father, and be with the church at Winnipeg, Lord, now that they continue to be vacant, Supply them also a full-time servant to preach the gospel and to, and to minister in the congregation. O Lord, be with the office bearers here. Grant that they may do their work diligently, cheerfully, and faithfully. And be with all those who are actively involved in the life of this church. We thank you for them and their families who are willing to spare them for these tasks. And Lord, be with the work of local Mission, bless that work, and grant that your name may be magnified through it. And be with our mission worker, Darren Verstegel, Lord, also give him what he needs, and that he may see the fruit of his labor. Be with us this morning, and give us a peaceful time together as we worship you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Let us now read from God's word. First, we will turn to the Old Testament, 1 Kings 16. Verse 29 through 34. This is God's word. In the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, the son of Omri, began to reign over Israel. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel and Samaria 22 years. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord, more than all who were before him. And as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, he took for his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. He erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. And Ahab made an Asherah. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. In his days, Heel of Bethel built Jericho. He laid its foundations at the cost of Abiram, his firstborn, and set up its gates at the post at the cost of his youngest son, Segub, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Joshua, the son of Nun. And then let's also read the first verse of the next chapter, chapter 17, which is our text, uh, along with the text from James. And this is the text. Now, Elijah, the Tishbite of Tishbe in Gilead, said to Ahab, as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these days, except by my word. Let's now read from the New Testament, the letter of James, chapter 5, the verses 13 through 18. Again, this is God's word. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil and in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will send the one who is sick, will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. And then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. Now, the part of the text is, for this morning, verse 16, the last part, the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Let us now sing together from Psalm 34, the stanzas 2 and 6. I sought the Lord in prayer, and he hears us when we call upon him.
So the text is 1 Corinthians 17, verse 1. Now Elijah the Tishbite of Tishbe and Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these days except by my word. And then from James 5, verse 16, the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Beloved congregation, brothers and sisters, occasionally an article will appear wherein the power of prayer is ridiculed. They will say that those who pray are not any better off than those who don't. Miracles just don't happen. Some will even supply so-called scientific proof. To make their point, they conducted studies of groups of people diagnosed, diagnosed with terminal illness. And they divided them into two groups, those who pray for healing or let others pray for them, and those who do without prayer. And their conclusion is that the two groups are not any different from each other. And so according to them, prayer is worthless. You might as well pray to your dead grandfather or to a rock. It's all the same. They also concluded that none of the other claims about the effectiveness of prayer can be scientifically verified. Take, for example, the simple claim that prayer connects you with God. In an article I read, it says, while this claim may have religious or philosophical implications, it doesn't specify any effect that we could measure in the physical world. How can we tell when someone is more connected to God? Well, what are we to think of this? Some may think that there's some truth to these claims. They think about those who have prayed for certain things, especially for healing, and whose prayers apparently were not answered. And so, does God hear prayer? Is prayer effective? Does it have the power that James claims it has? Or is it all a fraud? Well, brothers and sisters, this morning we will see that prayer is, like the prayer of Elijah, indeed very powerful and effective. In fact, without prayer of God's people, God will not act and fulfill his promises. Not that he is dependent on us, of course not, but that's how he keeps us connected to him. And that's how he maintains the bond with him. And so let us listen to the preaching this morning under the following theme. The prayer of a righteous man, like the prayer of Elijah, is powerful and effective. And we'll look at two things. First of all, Ahab's ungodly rule. And secondly, Elijah's powerful prayer. If there was ever a time for prayer, it was during Ahab's reign. If you think things are bad today, well, then look at what was happening at that time. It was an awful time that greatly troubled Elijah the Tishbite's righteous soul. It had been only 57 years since the split of the kingdom of Israel when Jeroboam rebelled and broke with his brothers Judah and Benjamin. They became two nations, one to the north, one to the south. But a lot had happened in those 57 years. The 10 northern tribes had seen many civil wars, whereon hundreds of thousands of people were killed. The one king was murdered by the next, and two royal dynasties were eradicated through murder. And the southern kingdom, Judah, was not any different. That was a nation that also ceased serving the Lord and constantly rebelled against him. But now with Ahab, things go from bad to worse. 
whereas the former kings of Israel only perpetuated the sin of Jeroboam, the sin of calf worship, bowing down to the image of an ox, as if that represented God, Ahab was not satisfied with this. He went much further, even further than his father Omri, who was also an evil king. Omri was an ambitious and politically astute man who, among many other things, built the city of Samaria, making it even more beautiful than Jerusalem itself. Isaiah, in chapter 28, verse 1, called Samaria a glorious beauty set on the head of a fertile valley. Omri also had grand ambitions beyond its borders, and to achieve that end, he made all kinds of alliances with foreign nations and even with his brother Judah. One of the alliances was made with Ethbaal, the king of the Sidonians, also known as the Phoenicians. This was very astute for the Phoenicians, a seafaring nation, had influence and power worldwide. To advance his cause, Omri had his son Ahab marry the king's daughter, Jezebel. She was as heathenistic as they come and wanted nothing to do with the God of Israel. She would like nothing better than to for the worship of this monotheistic God to be totally eradicated. The Sidonians, they were an especial idolatrous people. They made Baal their principal deity and worshipped him as the sun god, the god of life and fertility. Originally, this god was symbolized by a tree. The Sidonian king Hiram, who lived during the time of David and Solomon, went one further and he built the golden pillar in the temple of Tyre, the capital of Phoenicia. The golden pillar is much more flattering to the god than the tree trunk. Ahab, the king of Israel, made a duplicate of that pillar, can you imagine, in Samaria the northern cap kingdom's capital. And furthermore, he also set up an Asherah pole in honor of the goddess Astarte. After all, Baal also needed a wife. To add injury to insult, he also appointed numerous priests to maintain these gods and serve them. We will see more about that this afternoon. Ahab also rebuilt the city Jericho, even though the Lord God had warned Joshua that anyone who rebuilt that city would be punished. Ahab didn't care. He went right ahead anyway. But then we see that the curse mentioned in Joshua 6 verse 26 was fulfilled because the builder, Heel, lost both his oldest and his youngest sons. As we read, Byram and Segub both lost their lives. Why do you think that Ahab wanted to rebuild Jericho? Well, because he wanted to rewrite history. The ruins of Jericho reminded God's people of how the Lord rescued them from Egypt and brought them into the promised land and miraculously defeated their enemies before them. And Ahaz wanted to erase that memory. And that's what all those who do not want to reckon with God do. They want to have the honor and the glory for themselves. They themselves want to be worshipped. And that was Ahab's ambition. There's nothing new under the sun. We even see that today in totalitarian regimes, one of the most egregious of which is King Young un of North Korea. Ungodly people want to raise history that does not serve their agenda. They want everyone to believe certain things didn't happen. Forget about it. I'm the one, I'll tell you what is best. But you cannot erase the past. You cannot erase your own past either. You must deal with it and learn from it. 
if you want to function as a person or as a nation for that matter, you have to deal with where you came from, with your roots, with your history. Ahab wanted nothing to do with Israel's past. He wanted to forge a new path. And that was his undoing. It's not that Ahab was totally against worshiping the Lord, the God of Israel. It was politically astute of him to at least pretend to worship him. That is why, for example, he gave his children Israelite names that included the Lord's name. Furthermore, 1 Kings 18 verse 3 tells us that he also had Obadiah in charge of his palace and that he was a devout believer in the Lord. And at times Ahab even sought the advice of the Lord's prophets. No doubt Ahab was pricked in his conscience as he thought about all the things he was doing. He knew too much about the Lord God. You can never forget your history, your upbringing, and what you've been taught in your youth. That's also the case for those among us who have been brought up in the Lord, knowing the Lord God, and then later on turning away from him. They cannot erase what they have known in their youth. It stays with them, and that's a good thing. And in some cases, at a later age, they think about it again, and they repent, and they serve the Lord again. Thankfully, that does happen frequently. Ahab was a conflicted man. However, according to 1 Kings 21, verse 25, it was especially Jezebel who urged him on. As he pursued his political ambitions, he suspended his conscience. Ultimately, faith in God did not interest him. He was interested in achieving his own ends by hook or by crook. Do you know what the problem was with Ahab? The problem was that he was interested in the things of this world. He was in love with the beauty that this physical world has to offer. And that is why he built an opulent palace in Samaria which was inlaid with ivory. He loved to be the center of attention and to be a major player in the world. That's how the despots of today behave as well. They amass wealth and live in beautiful houses and possess many expensive toys. Just think about a man like the Russian president Putin. He, so they say he has a wealth of about $200 billion and has a $100 million ship just for his own pleasure. And those are the kinds of things that Ahab was driven by as well. And those worldly things made him blind. It made him suspend his conscience. Earthly pleasure, earthly beauty was much more important to him than divine splendor. He was there to create his own glory rather than to seek God's glory. Outside of Israel, however, Ahab had a good name. Oh yeah, those heathen kings and peoples around Israel, they admired him. In 1 Kings 20 verse 31, we read that the king of Aram refers to him as a great man. He was admired. He was going places. The northern tribes were becoming a nation to be reckoned with. And it was all due to Ahab's clever machinations. He was on top of the world. So he thought. At this point, Elijah enters the picture. It's the first time that he appears. And he appears unexpectedly. Typically, a prophet is first introduced. We are given a bit of background about his family, etc. That's not the case here. At this point, we know nothing about him except that he is a Tishbite, Tishbite from Gilead. From Gilead. 
Perhaps the Holy Spirit wants to indicate the urgency of the situation by the abruptness of his appearance. And the text says that he directly spoke to Ahab. Now, that was quite daring. He went, as it were, right into the lion's den, for he was not welcome there. On the contrary, anybody who speaks against the king puts his life in danger. Nevertheless, he goes to Samaria, the center of rebellion against the Lord God, and presents himself at the opulent palace of the king of Israel. And he rebukes Ahab in no uncertain terms. He begins by stating, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives. Please note that in your Bible, every letter of the word Lord is capitalized. And every word that we see in that sentence is very important, especially the word Lord. Whenever you see that, that you know that the Hebrew word Yahweh is used. It refers to his covenant, to his covenant name. The name Yahweh accentuates God's covenant relationship with his people. It is used when speaking to Moses in the burning bush for the first time. And the name means I am. It refers to his presence, his past, and the future. It refers to the fact that he is alive. It refers to the fact that he alone is the almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. Ahab treated God as if he did not exist. He thought that it did not matter what God you believed in. Well, says Elijah, the Lord, the God of Israel is real and active. He is present now to make sure that he gets the point. He adds that he lives. Now, just picture it, brothers and sisters. There stands Elijah before the king of Israel, who is attired in all his glory and is surrounded by his priests to Baal, dressed in all their splendor, their expensive silken robes and sashes, But Elijah, as we know from other scripture passages, is dressed in a simple, hairy animal's skin with a leather girdle. He comes from the back country of Gilead, a territory on the other side of the Jordan. It is a rugged mountain country. It's not the land of the sophisticated. It is a country of hunters, fishermen, and farmers. Elijah does not appear to be a refined man. No. However, inwardly, he is more refined than the opulent king and all his entourage with all its splendor combined. He was full of confidence that the Lord, the creator of heaven and earth, was with him all the way and that he would listen to him. He had no doubt about it. And that's clear from what he says. For he says that he serves that God, the SV says that he stands before him. In other words, he sees himself to be in God's presence, standing before his holy throne. He knows that God has made him one of his ambassadors on earth. When he, speak, as he, when he speaks as he does to Ahab, it is as if God himself is speaking to him. How can Elijah be so confident? It doesn't say anywhere that the Lord spoke to him directly and commanded him to bring these words. That's usually the case when prophets come with their proclamations. Elijah, however, knows the word of God. He knows his scriptures. He knows what the Lord said just before they came into the promised land. Namely, that he will provide for them and send them rain in its season. But he also says something else. That if you do not obey the Lord your God, as he says in Deuteronomy 11 verse 17, his anger will burn against them and he will shut the heavens so that it will not rain and so that the ground will not yield its produce. When he pronounces judgment upon Ahab, Eli is speaking 
the word of God. He is stating unequivocally what the Lord God himself has said. Elijah had no choice. He had to act as he did. How could he do otherwise? Normally, if you were a prophet of God, you would pray for God's blessings, including blessings on the crop. For that is what God promised to his people. But he promises that only if you are faithful and obedient. But how could Elijah pray for blessings under these circumstances? And how can you pray for, pray for blessings when the leadership of the nation and the vast majority of the country are in rebellion against God? Elijah had no choice but to pray for the execution of God's justice, for he wanted repentance. He wanted God's name to be honored. And this was a critical time in the history of God's people. The northern kingdom was about to sever their relationship with the Lord God. As you can read further in the book of Kings, there are only a few people left who were still serving the Lord. Indeed, some still alive during Ahab's rule lived during Solomon's reign before the kingdom was split. People in their late 60s and older would have observed how far the northern kingdom had fallen. If things continued the way they were, then there would be no one else left to serve the Lord. And that is why Elijah was compelled to go to Ahab to come with God's curse on the land. He told them that there will be neither dew nor rain within the next few years. That's what God said. And therefore, Elijah knew that that would also happen. And that, brothers and sisters, is what prayer is. It is recalling God's word as they apply in any situation. And God hears such a prayer. There's no doubt. That's the way it is also for us. When we pray, then we also stand before God's throne. Can you imagine? For it says in the letter of James that Elijah was a man just like us. He is not any different from you or me. When you pray, then you do so keeping in mind what God has told you in his word. You keep in mind the promises that he has given to you and that he has given to his people and how he fulfilled his promises throughout the ages. But you also keep in mind the curse on those who do not want to serve him. An effective prayer can only be done by those who are in tune with the word of God, who meditate on the word of God, who believe God's word, and who want to do God's will. Elijah hoped that Ahab and the rest of God's people would repent. But sometimes drastic measures are needed to make that happen. And that's what that is certainly what we see here. Ahab thought that God was impotent, that he would not act. He thought that he could do whatever he wanted without incurring God's wrath. And that is why he had to be made to realize that God does act. He had to realize the implications, not just for himself, but also for God's people. That if they continued to go the way that they were, God's final curse would come upon them. They would be totally alienated from the Lord God, not only in this life, but in the life to come. The Lord only wants to be surrounded by people who want to glorify him. Brothers and sisters, our prayers are about our covenant relationship with the Lord our God. When we pray, we are in direct communication with him. It is an intimate moment each time we pray to him. Prayer is an expression of our relationship with God. We pray based on what he tells us in his word. We pray because we know that God exists. He is the almighty creator of heaven and earth. Some more about that this afternoon. And what does he tell us? Well, that he created all things for his honor and glory. And that all things will happen according to his plan. 
He promises that whatever happens to us, no matter what it is, he will turn it to our good. Whatever God has in mind for this world will take place. But you must believe. When Elijah prayed that it would not rain, that indeed happened. And we made sure that whatever we pray for will also be fulfilled. If we pray according to his revealed will, we can trust that he will hear us. It may not happen at the exact time or manner we expect, but God promises that he will hear our prayers. But you may ask, can we really put ourselves on the same level as Elijah? Elijah, the great prophet of the Lord. We cannot expect that God will hear us in the same way, can we? And that he will right away do what we ask? Well, this is what a passage from Revelation 8 tells us. Namely, that God's justice is not carried out unless people pray. It says that when the saints, those who believe in God, pray for justice, their prayers are like incense. An angel takes those prayers and offers them to God. And then, as a result, God sends his fire, thunder, lightning, and earthquakes as a form of judgment. Why does God do that? For the sake of the saints. To show us how much he cares about us. God wants all evil and the effects of evil to be eradicated from the earth. He wants justice. And he wants us to be free from pain and sorrow that unbelief brings. He wants to save us. Does that mean then that whatever we pray for, as long as this promised in God's word, will immediately happen? No, it doesn't. God has his own timetable. He is wise. He knows what to do and when to do it. But it is true that God listens only to the prayers of believers, just like he did with Elijah. And the church must know that when she prays, her prayer is very powerful. And that's also the case with us as individual believers. God's word was immediately executed with Elijah. And that is because Elijah was completely in tune, not only with God's plan, but also with God's timing. God worked his prayer in his heart. Elijah was inspired by the Holy Spirit. He prayed as an Old Testament prophet to whom God spoke directly. And after which God executed his judgment upon that nation. That's different from today. The prophecies in God's word are fulfilled in different stages and at different times. Canada or any other nation, for that matter, cannot be called the people of God or God's covenant people. Today, God's people are scattered all over the world. We don't know when God will execute his plan or how he will save us from calamities. We may want certain things to happen right now. But it doesn't mean that the time is ripe. We also have to leave open the possibility of repentance. And that takes time. And the Lord, our God, is patient. Be glad that he's patient with us. The same thing is true regarding our personal prayers for healing. God is the God of miracles. And he can, if he wants, when we are terminally ill, terminally ill save us from impending death. He can perform miracles. And he does. That does not necessarily mean that that will happen at a specific time according to our schedule or that it will happen at all during our lifetime. Paul also prayed for the removal of the thorn in his flesh, but that did not happen either. But that did not mean that God did not save him or that he did not keep him from harm. He did. Paul is now experiencing an indestructible life with God. He is now tasting eternal life with his Father in heaven. Ultimately, God always fulfills his promises in his time. Unbelievers do not understand the power of prayer. 
They have no clue what prayer is all about. Prayer is only for those who believe and who are in a covenant relationship with the Lord their God, who love him and who cherish his nearness, who call upon him because they trust in him and know that he is the only God, the almighty creator of heaven and earth, who know that he has always kept his promises throughout the ages and that his word is sure and true. The statistical data of secular scientists are bunk. They base their scientific data on preconceived conceptions. They only prove what they set out to prove. They start out as unbelievers and are confirmed as unbelievers. And that's because they do not want to listen to the voice of God. And for that reason, their methodology is flawed from the very start. And such flaws are seen in their analyses which include all kinds of people, those who pray to Buddha or Allah, and those who pay for silly things. Does God hear those prayers? No, of course not. So can you scientifically prove prayer in this way? It's impossible. It's a matter of faith. It's a matter of understanding. It's a matter of applying God's word. It is a matter of knowing who the God of the Bible is who the God of this creation is. Brothers and sisters, the Lord our God is the God full of purpose. He rules all things, and he is going to bring this world to its final glorious destination. And all those who have not repented from their sins, who have ridiculed God's name and his people, who have persecuted them, will experience God, God's eternal wrath. The Lord our God is the God of justice, and he is perfect. So we can also be comforted with the knowledge that he will execute his justice equitably. But in the midst of all this, we as children of the Lord God will be preserved, just like he preserved Elijah, despite the danger he found himself in. Elijah was not afraid. We do not have to be afraid either. God will rescue us. Who knows what's going to happen in our lives? Who knows what's going to happen politically or economically? We don't know what the future holds, except that God is going to bring his creation, including us as his people, to a glorious end, and that through faith we may be part of that glorious future. And so, brothers and sisters, pray to him earnestly, especially when you're scared and full of despair. Pray to him when you are in difficulty. Pray to him when you want to have him nearby. Pray to him when you're hurting. He will hear you. He will embrace you. And he will answer your prayer. No doubt about it. God is real, and he dearly loves those who call upon him. He wants to hear from you at me. Amen. Let us now sing together from hymn 14, the stanzas 1, 9, and 10, the prayer of Habakkuk, Lord, I have heard the tidings.
Let us give thanks in prayer. O Lord, what a wonderful and mighty God you are, a God full of compassion, a God who has created us and who wants us to be near to him. And Father, we thank you for your love and your care. Thank you, Lord, for opening our eyes to the truth that you are alive and well, O Lord, and that we may avail ourselves of your power and of all your many other gifts. Lord, we thank you. And we ask you, O Lord, to proclaim your name to all those with whom we come into contact, and that we may do that within our families, that we may speak of your greatness, O Lord, and that that may also show in our lives that we love you. Father, we confess that we sin against you all the time, and we are always prone to put ourselves in the center. Lord, help us to continue to repent from that, that we realize at all times that we are nothing without you, and we are everything with you. Lord, we thank you for the gift of salvation through your Son, Jesus Christ. Bless us, Heavenly Father, also as we make our way from here and bring us back again this afternoon. Lord, that we worship you this day and that this whole day may be a day of joy because of what you have shown us in your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You now have the opportunity to bring your offerings to the Lord. And after the offertory, we will sing in closing from Psalm 17, the stances 3, 4, and 6. We are the apple of God's eye, and he protects us from all danger.
Receive now the blessing of the Lord and go in peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.